we had the situation where we were deriving the full file from the reaction. So in the product of the full reaction, or the high-end reaction, I should say, we had a catalyst in this shape, and we got this direction between the bottom. W is zero at the entry point, and it goes to the capital W at the end. Well. These people will have a certain conversion and a certain flow of coming in. Have flows of various species. And the question we're trying to ask is there's, well, there's several things we're looking at, but one in particular is how much kindness do we need? What should W be? That's an important consideration. Another important consideration is to recognize that coming in, we have a certain pressure to keep out. And leaving, we have an outlet pressure. And the class class is expensive. Plus, it so spends a substantial time deriving the Odin equation for pressure <coughs> the, the, the example we did or previously showed that actually we have to really be very careful about this pressure because depending on the particle size of the catalyst, depending on the viscosity of the gas, the temperature of the velocity of that catalyst, various physical parameters, we can actually go from P0, whatever entry pressure, all the way to a, a final pressure which is zero or atmospheric. So leaving, we have essentially pressure coming out at the ambient conditions. <coughs> we cannot have a reactor that's longer than that because you do not have the energy to push the material through it. The only other option is if you need a longer reactor is to increase the amount. So the Oden equation is very important to find what pressure drop is, and we created a new variable for that y is p of the p naught, or the fractional pressure drop. And I left you with the spreadsheets on the course website that you could go <coughs> and use that over equation given physical properties. So uh, we re require a whole variety of physical properties to use this over equation. So let's just make a note of velocity, the gas from uh, flux g, we require the density of the gas we're dealing with, the viscosity of the gas we're dealing with. Um, let's take a look at what else comes up in that equation. There's P0, the initial pressure is important. Uh, the diameter of the catalyst size, DP, is important. All of those parameters go in to determine what the pressure drop is going to be. And Quite quickly, these equations, these differential equations that show the profile along the reactor get, get very messy. So we ended off with a, with a class saying we had essentially two reactions, uh, two equations that are important, dx by dw, we call this function one, as a function of conversion and pressure, and we had another ODE dy by dw, function two as a function of conversion of pressure. So two differential equations in two variables, x and y. Capital X is showing for me what is the conversion along this reactor from beginning to end. So if I had to plot conversion over time, conversion x should start at zero. And as we go through the reactor, we'll keep increasing and increasing right up to the exit point. So my conversion, I can plot a graph of conversion versus the reactor length, W, or the catalyst weight. And I can also plot the graph of dy by dw. dy by dw is going to show me what that pressure relationship looks like across the reactor. <coughs> and we would expect it to look over the length of the reactor. I'll start with some in inlet pressure, P0, and then it will slowly decline as I move across my reactor. So conversion should go up, pressure should go down. Here's an interesting question I want you to think about for a minute. Coming into my reactor, I've got another variable that we've spoken about before, Q0, the inlet volumetric flow rate, meters cubed per second. Leaving my reactor, I'm going to have Q volumetric flow rate per second. Is that going to go up or going to go down or stay the same? 
hospital, cure the funeral, or cure not based from the beginning to the end. And the delta is a constant. Isobaric conditions and when epsilon is zero. Let's assume epsilon is zero, let's assume isothermal behavior. Based on this discussion we just had now, what will happen to Q? So even if epsilon is zero and even if T is equal to T naught, so let's consider a reaction where we have no increase or decrease in our moles in terms of the left and right inside of the equation, let's see isothermal behavior. What is going to happen to Q? Of course, you get the outlet, the smaller the difference in factor between where you are and what the other factor is. Okay. So you get the uh, slow down in the equation. So Q would go down. Yeah. I think the equation goes down, but it's compared to P0. Okay. P goes down relative to P0. You're losing pressure as you're going along the reactor. You're really high in that pressure coming in. Pressure is dropping as you move to the exit. P is going smaller and smaller. If you're dividing through by a smaller value, Q is going to go up. Very, very counterintuitive, very unexpected about plug flow reactors is that your volumetric flow rate increases. You've got more gas leaving your reactor, meters Q per second, than you've got going in. Very, very, very unusual for counterintuitive. Okay? An easy way you can interpret it is if you look at the ideal gas law well, PV equals NRT. For an ideal system, temperature is fixed, R is fixed, N is fixed if we assume that epsilon is zero, my number of moles is not changing. So if my pressure is dropping, volume is going to go up. As you go through this plug flow reaction from entry point to exit, you're going to see faster flow, uh, volumetric flow rates, greater volumetric flow rates leaving. So you're going to see that here in this cube simulation and in this example I'm going to consider this. So let's take a look at this example. But the key here is we've got a reacting system with A plus a half B going to C. Uh, it's an important reaction. This is the conversion to ethylene oxide. And it's a product there that's produced in the order of about 4 billion US dollars per year. So a lot of this stuff is produced. And our aim is to... Our aim is to obtain a conversion of 60%. And our question we're trying to answer here is how much catalyst W do you need? So we want to achieve an outlet conversion of 60%. We're not sure how much catalyst W to buy. 
how long should or how big should that reactor be to obtain that 60% conversion? So in the problem statement, there's enough information that you can um, derive those two differential equations. So I won't go through the derivation of the ODEs, that's what we did last class, but here's the, here's the solution to it. The x by dw is equal to minus ra dash over fa naught. We also have dy by dw is equal to minus alpha over 2 times y, 1 plus epsilon x. So that derivation is all from last class. The first equation is your standard ODE for a plug, uh, for a pack bed reactor. The second ODE standard for the Ogan equation. So no surprises there. What we want to know is how much catalyst W. Now, it's a bit of a catch-22 situation because this plug flow reactor has got a coordinate W at zero at the entry and we go all the way to the end, capital W. Okay. So I'm asking how much catalyst should we buy? What should capital W be? What's the weight of catalyst we buy? Well, I don't know because how far, how big should this reactor be so I can get 60% conversion? So the approach we take is, is, is one that's straightforward. Is we say, well, I'm going to start at the beginning of my reactor and see what my conversion is. It's going to be zero. And then I'm going to keep integrating my ODE until I get to the desired conversion 60% and then I stop. So it's a simple guess and check. Let me guess that a certain weight of W is required integrate my ODEs up to that W that I've selected as my initial guess, and I see what my conversion is. If my conversion is too low, I go to, to greater values of W. And I keep iterating until I find the desired catalyst weight. So in the problem statement, we're going to essentially, or in our solution, we're going to essentially plot that reactive profile of X. And incidentally, we're also going to get the profile of pressure over the reactor layer. So what we do is we've got these two ODEs. They're too difficult to integrate analytically. You can't integrate those uh, two simultaneous ODEs by hand. What do we know? We've got information given in the problem that tells me x and naught. Epsilon I know. Alpha I know. Alpha was the derivation we looked at in the previous class that shows what the Ogan equation is. Alpha is a function of the physical properties of the catalyst, and W is my ODE variable. So in terms of variables here, I've got X, and I've got Y, and minus RA is going to be a function of X. FA naught is a constant, alpha is a constant, X1 is a constant. W here, the denominator is called my independent variable. So we'll recall that, that terminology for ODE is the variable that you're integrating with respect to your independent variable. X and Y are the profiles you're going to plot. So in the question statement, there's enough information given here that I will just put up FA naught is equal to 0 0.1362 moles per second. That's my feed flow rate. K dash is my rate constant. So it comes from minus RA dash is equal to k dash um, 1 minus x and plus epsilon multiplied by the conversion times t over t naught. So that's my rate expression. k dash is given to me at 0 0.0074 moles per kilogram of catalyst per second. Alpha is a physical property that's a property of the, of the catalyst and the particle size, the density of the catalyst, the viscosity of the gas, and, and several other parameters that we looked at last time. That's 0 0.0367 of 1 over kilograms. And now we've got enough information to solve the problem. So what I'm going to show you here is the tool that, you will, uh, that many of you will use 
you don't have to copy all that information down, by the way. It is in the example in Fogler. The reason why I'm just putting it up there is because we're going to need it here in this uh, computer simulation. What I'm going to show you here in the simulation is something that uh, you can get the software off the Fogler CD. It's called Polymath. Um, you don't need to use Polymath. You can use MATLAB or you can use Python. So I will post the Polymath code. I will post MATLAB code and Python code for this example on the website that you can use in in uh, future, future examples. So from pretty much from this point onwards in your course, you're going to find that ODEs are too difficult to integrate by hand. And quite frankly, I don't really care that you can prove to me that you can integrate things by hand. What I really care about is that you can take the ODEs you've derived, integrate them numerically, and then most importantly, interpret the results. I don't really care about the final answer. I'm just trying to get it. So let's take a look. Polymath is a fairly um, straightforward piece of software that you type in what you call the ODE. DX by DW, so let's look at that first line up there. DX by DW is equal to minus RA dash of the FN weight. So it's a simple statement of what my first ODE is. The ODE needs an initial condition. So X at the entry to my reactor, X at time zero, or not at time zero, X at, at the W equals zero. So at first, that zero there refers to the entry point, W is equal to zero, is equal to zero. My conversion at the entrance to the reactor is zero. The second ODE, Y by W, refers to the pressure drop, Y. So Y is uh, that ratio of P over P naught, which we defined. So I'm going to look at how my pressure drop changes from the entrance to the exit of my reactor. And that's given by that equation over there, minus alpha over 2y, 1 plus epsilon times x. And I have to specify an initial condition for it as well. At the entrance to my reactor, p over p naught is 1. The entry pressure is p naught. Now, what I'll just quickly do here for you temporarily is just take this all away, because that's the full solution to the problem. And what I'll show you here is that what, if you had just typed that in, Polymath is telling you here, you have several undefined variables. It doesn't know what RA dash is, it doesn't know FA naught, it doesn't know alpha, and it doesn't know epsilon. So four unknowns. That X there tells you you can't begin to solve the problem yet. You have to specify what those variables are. So let's take a look. If I went in and typed RA dash, is equal to, and in this case we know it's uh, that, that, that function over there. I can I can type that in. Let me just rather just paste it back. So there's R A dash. I can define what R A dash is. I still have a few undefined variables. I've got those four now. So I need to tell it then what those are one at a time. And I can, I can just keep going, alpha is equal to, and we had a value over there, and epsilon, and k dash, and fa naught. So I'm just going to paste back what I had. So I'd like to break this up into uh, several subsections just to keep, keep things clear for myself. I'll typically, when I write these problems out, I'll have a whole section of just the pure constants, a section for purely the algebraic equations, section purely for the differential equations together with their initial conditions. And you may think that that's enough up to that point, but let's take uh, those two, those last two lines away and I'll show you. Uh, Polymath says, well, up to that point now, the message has changed. The message doesn't talk anymore about variables that are going to This time the message has changed to something different. It says, initial and or final values of the independent differential variable are not set. The independent differential variable is W. That's my independent variable. And it's telling me I do not have independent, I, I do not have initial and or final values for it. So that's what those uh, last two lines were for. The initial and final values for W. So here's the guess and check part. I'm at the entrance to my reactor, W at the entrance is zero. There's no catalyst at the entrance. And W at this fictitious variable that you use in polymath is f, final, is equal to whatever your guess is. So let's go guess that we needed 10 kilograms of catalyst to start. 
And if I do that now, you notice up here, Polymath tells me I'm ready for solution. So I can go run, go run the solver. So if I click the purple arrow, it's going to generate two things for me. It's going to generate a table of results and a graph of results. So there we go. For 10, for W test at 10 kilograms, there's my W axis, my independent variable. So that's D, the W as it's going from beginning to end. I get two curves, one for X and one for Y. X here is in blue, the conversion, and Y is my pressure drop. So by the point where I reach 10 kilograms of catalyst, I've got a conversion of roughly about 37, 38 percent. I haven't reached my objective of 60 percent yet. My pressure drop shows me here that I come in, I've got no pressure drop initially, and I've dropped down to about 80 odd, 82. 3% of pressure loss so far. So I haven't achieved my objective, so let's go back to the guess and check um, step and change that then to 15 kilos. We rerun the integration, and this time we've got about 50 odd percent. So we can add grid lines here in the right format. Let's add some grid lines there. So at about 50 kilograms, I got. Sorry, at 15 kilograms of catalyst, I've got about 50% conversion. And my pressure drop is now about 70% loss. <coughs> so, as you can guess here, we'll just simply update my, my, my initial value and my final values. Let's go to 20 kilograms of catalyst, reintegrate, and um, add these good ones back. So at 20 kilograms of catalyst, I've achieved pretty much spot on 60% conversion, and my pressure losses are in the order of 55% of my initial pressure. So I've retained 55%. If you go to higher and higher catalyst values, let's take a look at actually what happens if I go to about 25 kilograms of catalyst. I'm really going to get more conversion than I want. So I'm going to spend more money on buying buying the catalyst. I'm going to get greater conversion. So I can spend more money and buy five kilograms of catalyst. I will get greater conversion. But notice how much that has only changed by it. Very, very small increase. So a classic example of diminishing returns here. I've gone from by spending a bit of more money to buy that five additional kilograms of catalyst. I've only changed my conversion from 60 to about 64 percent, 65 percent. Okay, so very, very low returns for that additional money. Especially critical, uh, as we mentioned last class, that these, plat these catalysts are often extremely expensive. Platinum catalysts and so forth typically run um, run to many hundreds and thousands of dollars per kilogram. So that incremental conversion may not be worth. The additional money, but that's exactly what the simulation tool is, is here for. It's for you to try that. Also, notice that not only is your conversion gone up, but you've increased your operating cost. That pressure loss over the reactor is is more substantial. We've gone now to about 60% losses. Okay. So, so we're going to use this tool in the next uh, few classes. You're definitely going to use this in your course project to design reactors and figure out how big your reactor needs to be. And, and cost your reactor and size your reactor. What is the intercept for the uh, Which intercept? It's just coincidental with the cost. They're, they're just two independent. <coughs> Okay, so the tool for MATLAB will be the same. You'll have to, MATLAB is not quite as straightforward as this in terms of just typing in your own means as shown over there. Um, you have to type in the MATLAB code for your ODEs. Python, the same thing, but you'll actually find it fairly straightforward from the uh, code that I'll, I'll, I'll give you. One thing that's interesting is I define that flow ratio variable here, Q over Q naught. So we can, we can calculate Q over Q naught and create a new algebraic variable for that. I, call, I just call it flow ratio. So let's take a look at what that flow ratio is. So if I 
integrate those ODEs, by default, Polymath will only show me the plots of the differential variance. So it will only show me a curve of x and y versus y. But I can ask it to show me the values of other, other parameters by clicking here on the graph tab, I can say, well, plot me what W looks like on the x-axis against flow ratio on the y-axis. So if I go ahead and do that, I can see that right at the entrance to my reactor, my Q over Q naught is obviously 1. And very quickly, it rises almost to the point of approximately 2.4, or let's say 2.3. It means that the volumetric flow leaving that reactor is 2.3 times the volumetric flow at the entrance. A substantial, substantial increase in the, the gas flow rate there leaving at the end. And purely from that discussion we had there earlier. Okay. Any questions on that? How do you explain that physically? Okay, so uh, one way to consider it is, is by PV equals NRT. We've got a gas system here where we've got one A, one mole of A, plus a half mole of B going to C. So actually, epsilon in this case is a negative number. Epsilon um, is minus 0.15 in this example. So we're actually considering a system that's shrinking. Okay. But here I'm showing you that we've got expansion, tremendous expansion. So let's consider the case where this is pretty much, let's, let's say that that half a mole really isn't changing too much. You've got one mole on the left and one mole on the right. So let's consider the case where we've got no change in epsilon. Pretty much that epsilon here is a small value, it's pretty close to zero, let's consider it to be zero. So we take that out of consideration for a moment. Considering epsilon to be zero is the same as saying the number of moles in my system, n, is staying constant. R is constant, T is constant. So if pressure is decreasing, volume is going to go up. You're experiencing pressure losses across your reactor, something's got to give to compensate for that loss of pressure. Your volumetric flow is going to go up. And the, pure, the only reason for that is because mass in is mass out. So kilograms per second in must stay the same as kilograms per second out. The only thing that's got to change is volume expansion. No, it's not uh, good or bad. Just recognize that when we design these reactors, we consider a fixed tube. So you consider vol volumetric flow rate at your entry point. You've got that same diameter tube. What's going to happen is your Reynolds number is going to rapidly go up as you, as you go along the length of the reactor. As long as you can handle this, it's fine. And as long as your exit valves and sizing for the subsequent unit operations that come after the reactor are sized for an increased volumetric flow, people might assume that the volumetric flow out is the same as going in. Many of you assume that initially as your gut feels. It's like, why would the volumetric flow rate change? or change substantially. Here we're seeing it's gone up by more than double. So you're going to have to size your valves, you're going to have to size downstream unit operations for twice the volume of the flow rate that you have from here. That's why it's fine. Anything else? Okay, so let's review the midterm. Um, the midterm is on everything we've covered in this course up to today. And if you're looking for chapter references, it's chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 in the new version of Fogler. And in the old version of Fogler, it's chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and a half. So the first half of chapter 4. In terms of timing, the midterm will be in the order of about two hours normally. It is an infinite time midterm, infinite in inverted quotes, because I will leave here by 11.30 p.m. So the exam will start at 5.30. Normally, you should be able to finish by 7.30. I'm leaving 11.30. Um, so there's, the, the point is that there's no stress on you in terms of 
finishing up. Um, I haven't said it yet, so I don't know what's in it. But let's take a look at what's in that picture. So if you're looking for resources to study, there's, there's the tutorials, there's the assignment questions. The full solutions to uh, assignment one and two have been posted. I'll post the solutions to assignment three later today. The um, textbook has got a lot of problems in it. You've all probably discovered the solutions manual to the textbook online by now. And those are great for you to work through. Also, the Fogler DVD has a, a large number of additional problems on it that are not in the textbook. So if you've got the DVD, there's uh, pretty much more than double the number of problems on the DVD than there are on the printed version. So plenty of possibilities for you to work through. Let's take a look at chapter one and what we cover. So chapter one looks at all balances. And we consider the reactor and there were several several types. We spent actually quite a few classes on chapter one. We looked at batch reactors, we looked at CSTRs, we looked at plug flow reactors, and we looked at pack bed reactors. So you can go back to your notes and we've derived the more balances for each one of those. We called this actually at that point in time the contacting pattern. How do I bring my reactants in contact with each other? Is different in, in these different situations. And it affects the way that we get our products needed. Okay, so various equations for each one of these. I won't go through the derivations, obviously, here again. But the key point is. Understand what the assumptions were. And why they were necessary to derive those small values. We also considered in that chapter not just the contacting packing, but we also considered the <coughs> rates. We spent a bit of time talking about what rates were. Remember, we had a discussion on intrinsic properties, uh, intensive properties and extensive properties. We mentioned that reaction rate is an intensive property. Rates are really important to us. Uh, there's two types of rates that we can consider if we want to speak in very loose terms. One is a slow rate. And for that we need to use the minus RA expression. So for a very slow reaction system, I must consider minus RA. Minus RA tells me how fast I consume A, and by extension tells me how fast I generate my product. Fast systems, so a system that happens so rapidly that you really don't see a substantial, or you don't see a slow, gradual change in your species, but the change happens so quickly that you land up with your products in pretty much no time, those systems are not called rate limited, those are called equilibrium limited. So you use your equilibrium equations. So a system has really two, two distinctions and everything in between obviously exists, but for the most part slow systems we must use our rate expression. So these would be systems such as systems of reactions that take place in your body, wastewater treatment, mining industries. Those are typical situations where you're limited by your rate. Many other systems in the chemical industry happen so quickly that there's no point in trying to derive rate expressions. The reaction rates constants in those rate expressions are phenomenally large so that you don't really need to consider the rate. And essentially there you're limited purely by what the equilibrium conditions are. You're going to reach equilibrium rapidly, in other words, is what that's telling you. Recall we had a discussion earlier that said reaction rate is non-zero until you reach equilibrium, where the very definition of equilibrium is that your reaction rate is zero. So at equilibrium, you've got no reaction rate occurring. You're extremely, um, you reach it extremely quickly. So you can calculate what's leaving your reactor based purely on the equilibrium constant. That, that is a very important discussion. If you hear people in the reactor design area talk, 
They will talk about rate-limited reactions, and they'll talk about equilibrium-limited reactions. So understanding what that terminology is is important. So chapter one, we spent a substantial time on that, probably longer than we would normally do, but I felt that that was an important introduction to the material, and understanding every one of those four contacting patterns very carefully is, is critical. We then moved on to chapter two, where we were looking at the conversion and design of reactors. So the very first thing we did over there was we defined what the conversion is. And we looked at it in terms of two major classes of reactor batch reactors, where we defined Na is Na naught one minus x. And the key design part is that the time you need for your batch reactor is the integral from zero to the desired conversion of x. Na naught dx over minus Ra times the volume. That was the one major class of reactors. The other class of reactors we considered were flow reactors. So these are CSTRs, PFRs, and PPRs, where we've got flow in and out of the system at steady state. Batch reactors, by their very definition, do not have flow. So flow reactors then have, um, we considered CSTR and plug flow reactors. For the CSTR, we had the volume is FA naught of minus FA over minus RA. And for the PFR, we had the volume is given by the integral from 0 to x dx over minus RA. So these are four, three equations we're extremely comfortable with right now. Notice that every one of them has one over RA in the new, in the, in the, or it's got the inverse denominator. Every single one has minus RA over here in the denominator in the denominator. specified in terms of x, the conversion, that's the first step we do. And then we can, we can use our design equations to find either the time or the volume of the reactor. Okay, so depending on the type of reactor we're designing, we'll use time for batch, V for flow reactors. And we'll do that by, by finding the area under the curve. Okay, so the area under the curve is proportional to the time with which you operate a batch. The area under the curve is proportional to the volume for a plug flow reactor. Or we can use two points on the curve for 
for CSTR. So a CSTR, to size that reactor, you require two points on the curve, one for the inlet and one for the exit. So for example, if I was designing a reactor, a single uh, CSTR, I need two points, I'm oh, sorry, two points on the curve, by that I mean inlet and outlet. And I read up and I get my volume. Okay, so two points, let me uh, actually clear that up, not on the curve, but let's say to be concrete here, two points on the x-axis. The reason why I make that distinction of two points on the x-axis is because if we have CSTRs in series, my next CSTR, the outlet of the first CSTR is the inlet to the, to the subsequent one. And so then, again, I need two points, the inlet and the outlet. And that second reactor will be the whole, the second reactor. So this would be V1, that would be V2. So be, be clear on designing reactors based on these inverse rate plots. These plots are very, very important for reactor design. Every subsequent chapter in the textbook just looks at different ways and we come back to this plot mathematically or graphically. So chapter three then, Folder, we started to get back into some chemistry. Chapters 1 and 2 were really purely applied engineering. Chapter 3 was, let's go back to our chemistry and understand what these expressions are, and let's understand the We combine those two then to design our reactor. Summarize chapter three. I'd say the main purpose of chapter three is to say minus R A is a function of various inputs. We spent quite a bit of time showing what that function looks like. That function is a function of temperature and it's a function of X, the conversion. And it's a function of temperature from to other rates of the other species in the system. Under that topic, uh, pay careful attention to the difference between elementary reactions and non-elementary reactions. And also pay attention to the discussion we had on reaction order. And so those are those are concepts in chemistry that we, we must all be clear on. Furthermore, we also considered the equilibrium constant. And we considered what reversible reactions are. What is an so an elementary reaction is where the rate expression is, is a function directly of the stoichiometric coefficient. Non elementary is where you'll start to see things like something raised to the power of 0.5 or 3.2 or something like that. Okay, so a lot of what you might consider boring chemistry was covered in this chapter. A lot of this, recall, was classes where we derived several derivations on the board and it was pretty tedious at times. 
But all these concepts are, are going to be critical as we start to bring them together in chapter four, five, and six in the, in the next few classes. Okay, so those were important theoretical concepts. Under stoichiometric tables, understand what delta means, what epsilon means, what theta means, what Q means, what Q naught means. We've looked at a number of those derivations there in stoichiometric tables. All of those tell us how the system is changing all the time. So as you, as you look back actually in this review, you start to see actually how much we've really covered in the past few years. So for those of you uh, that have the older version of Fogler, this is chapter 3. For those of you that have the newer version, this is chapter 3 and chapter 4. Covered in here. So Fogler, the newer version, splits it up into two parts, but it's the same, the same material. Now in the past three classes, or four classes I guess, we've looked at, at the main topic of isothermal reactors. Okay, so for those of you that have the new version of Fogler, this is chapter 5. And this would be chapter 4 in the newer version of Fogler, in the older one. So. Very critical in the isothermal reactor, we introduced the, this concept of how to tackle any reactor design problem. Any reactor design problem should look at the defined step, the explore step, but what this chapter focused on particularly was the planning step. Where we, in that handout that we had, we had a very, uh, a single page handout that showed the flow chart that you must follow for any reactor design problem. That's critical to understand what that flow chart is. And you, should, you will notice that if you look back at how I've tackled these problems, I followed this, this procedure where we define, explore, plan before we actually jump in and get to the numerical part where you actually solve the problem. There's two other important steps to do afterwards to check and to generalize. To make sure we, we also cover those two parts. Particularly, at the very minimum, check your answer for reasonable values. So that was the first part of that chapter. The next part of the chapter was where we considered batch reactors. We had a, a review of batch reactors. They're phenomenally useful to calculate what our rate constants are. So they're very useful to obtain K. So we had a class where we, we showed how I can calculate what the rate constant K is based on a plot of time versus concentration. I really like batch reactors for this reason because by its very definition, a batch reactor is not steady state. Things are changing very dramatically over time. And so with a single experiment, I can obtain a very rich data set to get K. CSTR do not have that benefit at all because CSTR operates a single rate. Batch reactors are great for that because you can get a very, very uh, quick answer for that reactor uh, reaction constant. <coughs> We uh, then spent the last few classes looking at flood flow reactors and packed bed reactors. That's pretty much where we ended up in tonight's class. We looked at the concept of expanding gas systems. Okay, so they're understanding that epsilon term is, is critical. What's going on in a plug flow reactor and a packed bed reactor in terms of expansion? There's also the important Bogan equation. And we then looked at this evening's class is integrating. Now the Ogan equation, you'll recall from that derivation, we looked at two, two variations on it. The one was the Ogan equation in its most general form, but then we also looked at, in the, in the previous class, the simplified, 
simplified version when epsilon is zero. Okay, so simplified version when epsilon is zero. That gave us a, a, a great, great simplification, which actually can be integrated by hand. Okay, in general, the Ogan equation is too complex to, to, to integrate by hand, but the simplified version with that assumption of isothermal behavior and epsilon equals zero, we can actually uh, integrate. So that's what we've been considering then in the isothermal section. That's a pretty much a 20 minute review of what we've covered in about five weeks. Um, and what you'll see then in the midterm.